Greetings, everyone. Yeah, greetings, everybody. Bob, Gloria, it's a pleasure to have you on, as always. My gosh, see pleasure. lots of fami familiar faces. You know, Hello, hope to see some that aren't aren't uh, that are new this time, maybe. Um, so it's eight o'clock. It's time for us to to get going. Bring my microphone over here so it's a little closer. And um, I want to welcome everybody to August. I drove my MGA this morning to uh, to my gym, and it was I don't know sixty something or other. I had my T-shirt on. It was like really really nice. I've been out on the expressway. I, I, the windshield would have got me, but I was only doing I don't know at the most fifty. So it was really really sweet this morning here in Michigan. So I know it's warmer and colder in different places. Anyway, let me. Let me uh, welcome everybody and explain how, how this works. We've got 79 people on right now. That'll so probably rise up a little bit. Uh, Doug Clark is our official counter. So at the end of the session tonight, uh, we'll ask Doug how many he saw on there that were the most. I could keep track of it myself, but I, I'm supposed to watch the camera and answer your questions. So this is our MG technical Zoom. Uh, it's open to anyone with a MG or any, any BMC car, anybody, I don't care who watches, it's nice. And um, you can watch everyone either through a gallery view, everyone's the size of a postage stamp, or you can watch through speaker view. And that is the person who's speaking takes precedence on your screen and fills up the screen pretty much. During the time that I'm on here, I will repeatedly hit mute all, which mutes everybody as they come on, not because I don't like you, but because there's barking dogs and dishes being washed and grandchildren explaining to their grandparent how to, how to work on, uh, how to make their computer work. So while you're on mute, if you want to break in and say something, or if I call on you because you put something up in chat, there's two ways to do that. One is to take your, at least on my computer, there's two ways. One is to take your cursor down to the left-hand side of the screen and find the, the uh, mute uh, button there and just unmute it and then you can speak or you can simply hold down your space bar while you're speaking. That's pretty handy if you just wanna chime in for a moment, make a comment. Over on the right-hand side of your screen, right-hand side of my screen, uh, there's a chat section. You can go on there. You can post questions on there. We'll get to them after a while. And I, anything, I don't care. It can be about the, the differential gears. We always have a subject to start stuff off with and because it's summer and it's hot. And because I just got the wonderful picture of a plastic impeller that fell off a water pump, um, I, I decided that maybe tonight we talk about cooling systems and radiators and water pumps and so forth. Um, I want to bring you up to date on, on numbers. It's, uh, it's really nice. The, I uh, subscribe, use constant contact to send out a note to everybody. And right now I've got 5,246 names on there uh, on our last, my last email out to you, which was yesterday. The open rate was like 33%, which is pretty good. And I always look for spam reports. You know, people who say, oh, I didn't, why is my name on this list? Because there hasn't been anyone added by anyone other than people adding their own names through my website. And uh, so there are no spam reports this time, but there was one unsubscribe. And there's the standard stuff, the content no longer relevant to me or there's a little field in there where you can put down something else. And this guy put down, bought a better car. So anyway, it's probably best that he's not on here anyway. So anyway, we've got um, Constant Contact has got uh, 5,246 that I send emails out to. Our uh, Facebook page has got 3,533. I don't know how many videos I have up, but it's over 350. It's hard, hard for me to negotiate that, that great big site and find out how many videos I've got. I haven't a clue, but I do know that there are 21,600 
and 53 subscribers to you, my YouTube channel. And there are 9.333 million plus some, 9.333 million views. So thank you everyone for watching those videos because every time that you click on it, I get paid something. I'm not sure how much, but anything times 9.333 million is something. And I, I appreciate that. I have to make my comment here that I do, um, I do have expenses. This isn't just uh, me sitting behind my computer and volunteering my time. I, I have to pay for constant contact. I have to pay for Zoom. I even have to pay for insurance. Who knows, because somebody hears something on here and does it and then their widow uh, says, well, you know, he wouldn't have done that only that uh, this guy said to do it. And so anyway, it's just uh, insurance that I can keep my own home for longer than I might be able to keep it otherwise. Anyway, those are all costs. So I would appreciate everyone who goes on, I appreciate everyone who goes on my uh, page on the internet, uh, universitymotorsltd.com and finds that yellow PayPal button and presses it and sends a donation. Some are, some are, are just regular numbers and some are uh, unbelievably handsome. Thank you very kindly. I have a list to thank tonight. Here we go, we'll take a moment. Since the last time we were up, I've got Tony Shoviak, Glenn Nikelski, Edward O'Hauer, Gary Fitzgerald, Al Heller, David Vincent, Doug Clark, our official counter, Scott Miller, Alan Fetner, Steve Kaplan, Crystal Johnson, Hal Perlman, Hal, thank you, Milton Babarak, Greg Fisher, Dean Hickenlooper, Bobo Tanner, Michael Baldwin, Tom Capobianco, Jeff Fields, David McCracken. I keep saying I'm gonna send a note out to everybody and I've got quite a stack of notes to send out, but anyway, you're publicly thank thanked and I thank you very, very much for that. I think that's it for, as far as bookkeeping and introduction. So I wanna talk just a little bit about radiators and water pumps and stuff like that, then we'll open it up. And the first part of the conversation will usually follow along with that. Because we're starting at eight o'clock Eastern tonight, we'll cut it off real close to, to 10 o'clock when, uh, when the, the two hours is up. When I start at seven, sometimes we'll go for three hours, uh, but tonight we'll shut it down. In the next meeting we'll have, I'm gonna skip next week because I bumped last, last time. So I'm gonna skip the one we would normally had next week. And my next one will be on the 23rd. So it's the, the um, I think it's the fourth Monday, the 23rd of August. Oh, I did want to say that uh, this, this weekend, my daughter and I, Barbara and I, are going to California. That's where she lives. That's where her car is. And I'll be out in, in the greater Los Angeles area for about two weeks, a couple of Southern California MG Club events going on during that time where I might, if you're a member or want to become a member or want to come along, say hi, it'd be a pleasure to see you. Then I'm coming back here and immediately going to Altoona, Pennsylvania, to the Central Pennsylvania British Car Fest, hosted by Jim and Lori Pastor from Altoona. There's also a short, uh, short two-day technical seminar prior to that event in Altoona. I come home from that and then I fly out to Portland, Oregon to the all British uh, field meet next to uh, PIR, uh, Portland International Raceway, which is in the same valley, same plain as the airport in Portland, Oregon. So then I'll be home for a couple of weeks, longer than that, six weeks. And now, then I'll be in Washington, DC, the greater DC area at the Hunt Country Classic, sponsored by the um, Washington, D.C. Um, MG Car Club. So those are the places. Maybe I'll get it all organized to give to my daughter to get up on my website. I hope so. 
um, so you can see what these dates are. And yeah, if you have a chance, come along to the shows. They're really, they're really great. And everybody's so anxious to get out of the house and go to the shows, even though now there's, you know, there's, there's trouble afoot again, you know, um, just some conversations uh, in California about, about the Delta variant, you know, so geez, won't this go away, please. Anyway, let's talk about radiators and uh, water pumps. So of that gallon of gasoline that you buy, which has got approximately 120,000 BTUs available in heat, one third of it goes in the radiator, one third of it goes in the exhaust, and if everything's perfect, one third of it is available at the flywheel uh, to send back to the gearbox and back to the rear wheels to push the car along. So there's a lot of heat involved here, a lot of heat. And to cool the engine, the engine's got coolant that circulates inside it, water, um, antifreeze, uh, some, some fluid in there, it's basically water. And that's pushed up through the top of the engine, out the thermostat, once the thermostat is open, into the radiator, it flows through little tiny tubes in the radiator where the air coming across into the car uh, transfers that heat from the radiator to the atmosphere. And then that's drawn back up into the engine by the water pump and pushed um, throughout the engine where it begins to repeat the process. Now the cooling systems in all of our cars were okay when they were made. The cars did never had a, um, a problem, 75 midgets did, but the rest of them didn't as far as overheating. So sometimes your car overheats. And so you go, oh my gosh, what's the matter? What can I do? So the first thing to do is to find the word overheating and to check to see if yes, indeed, the car is actually overheating. You know, those little guns that everybody used in their stores to shoot your forehead when you walked in. There ought to be a, a lot of those pretty soon available on Craigslist, I hope. Anyway, you can get one of those. So you can shoot your engine and see what the temperature is. So if your temp gauge says normal, what does that mean? Does that mean 180? Does that mean 190? Does that mean 220? Who knows what normal means? Normal used to mean something, but that was when Smith's was making the temperature sending units. Now somebody else does. And do they make them correctly? Well, a lot of them don't. A lot of the problem, there are a lot of problems with the sending units that fit into the cylinder heads, 1968 and newer on the, on the MGBs and the midget 1500s, MGCs. And they record, um, they indicate that the temperature is much hotter than it is. So how hot should the engine actually be? Around 195 is great. You know, that's, that's pushing, that's 90, 95 Celsius. Um, you can go right up to two, 212, there's no problem as long as the system's closed. In fact, the hotter the car is, the easier it is for it to dissipate the heat. Imagine if the radiator was 400 degrees and the amb ambient temperature was 70. It's a lot easier for the heat to transfer out of the radiator into the air if the, if the temperature differential is greater. Modern cars run at a higher temperature. Um, you know, trying to make your car run at 160 or something, that's craziness. It's too cold, the clearances aren't good enough. So you wanna be running around 195. The bottom line is you don't want it to overheat, boil while you're driving. So if it's not boiling over while you're driving, you're okay. What happens when you come and park it? And then it, and then it over, overheats, then it, then it barfs out some fluid. It's okay, usually. Um, it's just seeking its own level. This happens immediately after you've filled up the radiator. Right, when you turn the car off, there's a lot of extra heat in the engine that has to get someplace and the cooling fans stop turning. So the engine and radiator get much hotter just for that 10 minutes or so after the car has been shut down. If you've got a mechanical gauge, you can watch that right on the dash. 
it'll go up to, to, to 220 to sometimes 230. Oh my gosh. My, uh, my girlfriend, Mary, and I drove Route 66 out to Loops. So it won't work if I can't remember the Solvang to the MGA event in Solvang in 2017, 2016, and, and um, Route 66. And while we were on our way there, we intersected a couple of times with a group of people, group of MGA owners who were driving their MGAs from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. They joked and said that sometimes their temperature gauges showed 100 pounds of oil pressure. 80 pounds of oil pressure because the needle had come up so far, so far, and yet they were still running. So as long as it doesn't boil over while you're driving, you're okay. The radiator cap, um, which was introduced at the TF, allows the, allows the temperature of the radiator to get higher than it would normally before boiling starts. So for every pound on the cap, you add three degrees to the boiling point. This is why I use a pressure cooker in Denver, Colorado, because the water boils at too low of a temperature. So with a radiator cap, you can get all in, teasing it up to 240 degrees before it's gonna boil. And um, the coolant also suppresses the boiling point, the glycol antifreeze. So let's see, there's some rules here. Water pumps never go bad. Now I happened to show one when I sent that out. Um, Guy St. John sent that to me, a plastic impeller on a steel shaft. I've got a couple like that too. Uh, one I had had melted away because the engine got so hot. I mean, you gotta get really, really hot to melt. I mean, there can't be any coolant left in the engine. Uh, another one, somebody dropped a nut or a bolt or something down when they were changing the thermostat. Somehow that got down into the, into the uh, cavity that the water pump runs in and burst the impeller, the plastic impeller. Um, water pumps go bad for, for um, two reasons. One is they start to leak. There's a seal in them. And that, that can get bad and start to leak. And the other thing that goes faulty is the bearings. So if you've got a fan on the front of your water pump, you can grab the fan and if you can wiggle it back and forth, you know the bearings are bad. Just because the bearings are bad doesn't mean the seal leaks. And just because the seal leaks doesn't mean that the bearings are bad. Radiators can and do plug up. They can silt up, they can get a bunch of crap in, in, the, in the inside of them. So while the car's idling and you got the bonnet open, put, your, put the back of your hand, which is more temperature sensitive than the front of your hand, put the back of your hand on the radiator or use your gun and shoot it and just go all the way across the front of the radiator and every tube, every vertical line should be the same temperature. Now it's gonna be hotter on top and cooler on the bottom, because the, the hot water enters the radiator at the top and then exits the bottom after there's been some cooling done. So there'll be a difference top to bottom, but there should not be much, if any of a difference left to right. If you find a section that's like stone cold, it's because the tubes through which the coolant passes are plugged up. You can buy radiator coolant. It's, uh, I don't know, potassium hydroxide, something that's a um, lie. It's a, it's a um, dreadful, <laughs> dreadful stuff, but you pour it in and, and uh, sometimes it'll clean out, clean out the inside. It's extremely rare that the inside of the engine itself silts up so much that it impacts the flow of water. But take a TD engine that hasn't been apart for 50 years. I mean, I suppose you can find an MGB engine hasn't been apart for 50 years. The TD has got a funny little channel that runs down the side and the water, the water pump pushes water all the way off, externally, all the way to the back of the block, brings it up into the head. Um, and and that's, how it, that's how it moves the water through there. The MGB, the, the MGAs, MGBs, that B-series engine just blows the water 
from the pump just back in, into the block and it all seems to find its way back up front again. You do need a thermostat. The engine is designed to run at a certain temperature, just like a human body. Maybe not quite within the confines that our bodies run, but it runs best around 195. I had a customer one time who was driving through Ohio in the middle of winter in his MGB. He said his temp gauge barely came off cold. He used two quarts of oil in, in, in 100 miles. Um, and you know, when he, when he got out of that snowstorm that he was in, that blizzard, icy, unbelievably bitterly cold air, um, he never used any oil after that. It was just during that time, it was because he was running the engine so cold that the clearances weren't good enough. A lot of the cars that we saw from the South in, in my shop, they come up from Florida or Texas, South Carolina, no thermostats. You guys know more than I do about how to run the car down there and make it work. But to me, the thermostat should still be in there because the thermostat doesn't control the upper end of the temperature. It controls the bottom end of the temperature. It, it's, um, it, it opens when the car reaches, when the engine reaches a certain degree, 195 or 180, whatever you got to set at, but 195 is best. The upper end, is a function of how much heat the engine's making and the ability of the radiator to get that heat into the air. If the ambient air is 100 degrees, it's going to be harder to get the heat out of the radiator than it would be if the ambient air is 60 degrees. Going back to that, that idea that the hotter the coolant is, the better its ability to get rid of the heat because of the temperature difference between the radiator and the air. Let's see. In 1977, they just said, oh, well, this is true of the MGC, but uh, in 77 with a B, they decided that they wanted to make sure that the radiator was always full. So they put an expansion tank in the circuit. So you fill the cooling system with a plug above the thermostat, but once it's filled and you've got water in the expansion tank, coolant in the expansion tank, then when you drive, if there's any air in the system, it forces it out of the system into and bubbles up through the expansion tank. Then when the engine cools, the coolant contracts, it draws fluid out of the expansion tank. So that system works great as long as there aren't any leaks anywhere in the system. It's not necessary. Some people have a, a, a barf tank, <laughs> a, a, a spill tank hooked up to the radiator, uh, just because sometimes they get someplace and it's especially hot and all the MGBs and, and, and uh, midgets will all, will all spill out a certain amount of fluid because fluid expands when it's hot and if it gets too hot, it's gonna spill out. Heater control valves silt up, but we're not talking about the heater, we're talking about the, the engine. So that's about it, I mean, it's a pretty simple, simple system. I know people are going to ask tonight, because I got asked before on a, you know, do the fan shrouds make sense? And I'm, I'm willing to listen. It, it, they don't seem to make sense to me out on the open road. Just look at it. It covers up part of the radiator. But at low speeds, maybe it helps the air get through. I do know that it makes a difference how close the cooling fan on the water pump sits to the radiator, the closer the better, until you get so close that when you go over a bump and the engine moves, it uh, punches a hole in the radiator with the, with, the, um, with the fan blades. That's no good. But I wonder about the, if those lightweight fans that got a little tiny synchronous motor in it that used to run a turntable when you listen to LPs, I wonder if those are, are, are as, effective as an engine cooling fan, it can't be. The engine cooling fan, when you take it off, uh, you read some instructions and it'll, it says you can save a horsepower. That's a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy, horsepower. So especially when you're dealing with only, only mm, on a, not a reasonably tuned MGB, about 60 horsepower at the rear wheels. Oh, let's see, about it.
So we're gonna we're gonna open it up now. I'm gonna go to the to the um, front section of the chat, and um, and we're gonna see uh, try to get the questions about cooling systems first. But the first question is completely different from Peter. So we'll just we'll hit this, and uh, Peter, you can unmute yourself. Peter says, I'll be removing my rear sway bar, my 77B, to replace all the worn rubber. Is there anything I should be aware of? Uh, tips, when removing the sway bar, before you tighten it all back up and adjust it completely, uh, put a jack under the center of the rear axle, jack it up so it just begins to lift the MGB up off the jack stands. Just leave the jack stands there. That's its normal resting position. So it's at that point that you tighten up the, the uh, those bolts. It takes it takes a five eighths, I think five eighths and eleven sixteenths, or eleven sixteenths and three quarters. Pretty good size bolt that goes through those trunnions that fit on the end of it. They go through the frame of the car, and also the the mounts that go on the rear axle themselves. This is true in the front end. Uh, when you're doing front end work, you should always jack the car up, jack that side of the suspension up so that it approximates the normal load. So when you tighten it down, all the bushings are in their normal location. If you tighten up the bushings here and then and then let the car come down, then the bushings get stressed. So don't tighten them up in a stressed position, tighten them up where they would normally be. So uh, that was Peter. Are you on here, Peter? Yes, I am. I, now, you just mentioned that, and I replaced the uh, bushings in my front sway bar about four years ago, and you just say and take the stress off of it, and I didn't know that. That thing was a bitch to put on with when it was <laughs> trying to get it on there. Now I know why. Well, yeah, I, aside from the fact that those vertical links, absolutely. I mean, you can imagine if you jack it up, it's like, oh, look at that. It, you know, otherwise, you're hanging on the on that front anti sway bar, trying to get it, trying to get the torsion, you know, to allow you to to uh, get it in place. But yes, yeah, especially the A arm bushings on the on the on the inside, the A arm bushings that go between the A arms and the fulcrum. So yeah, they're real tight. Okay, thanks a lot for the tip. I'm glad I glad I did that because I didn't. Uh, it looked like it's going to be a um, a bit of a uh, problem laying on the on the on the floor doing that. So I'm glad for the glad you gave me that tip. Thank you. You're, you know you can go to Home Depot and buy those rubber mats. That's that's what I I mean when I had my shop we had hoists. Oh my gosh I think we had one two three four four hoists. You know is really nice. I mean there's no substitute for a hoist. But if you don't have one, go to Home Depot and buy that mat with a with the uh, little um, tags along the side so you can hook the mats together. People put them down in front of the workbenches. You lay those down, a couple of those underneath the car, and it, it takes the stress off your shoulder blades when, when you're making direct contact, otherwise making direct contract, contact with the concrete. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Okay, here we go. Here's from Judd. Judd from South Carolina. So, <clears throat> So you can unmute yourself, but anyway, he starts off. He says, "I, I guess I'm just bragging, but I drove my MGA uh, Mark II 180 miles Saturday in 90 plus degree temperatures over the Blue Ridge Parkway and back, and it never exceeded 190 Fahrenheit. Pure stock. What a wonderful car!" So, just uh. I mean, we went from 850 above sea level to 4,000 above sea level and just uh, roared and raced, had a wonderful time. Couldn't do it in the TD. I'm still working on that. Okay. So the, the, the fact that you can climb, you know, climb, which takes a, a lot more energy and therefore you get a lot more heat that's coming into the radiators, that engine's working. Um, it's a function of getting the air through the radiator. Now, some people say on the MGAs that they changed the radiator style in 1962 so that more air would go through it. Maybe that's true. It's probably more true that their, that their sales were in the toilet and they were trying to dress the car up any way they could. 
and they came out with, with a different grill. But in the case of the MGAs, all you have to do is go to one, one show where they got 10 or more MGAs in a row and just walk down the line of MGAs and look at the, at the teeth in the grill. Some of them are absolutely flat out right next to each other. And you go, how in the world does any air get through there? Well, it doesn't very easily. Some people turn, some, some of them are turned a little bit. I got rid of mine altogether, much to the disgust of Forrest Johnson, who took over my shop. He trades his rusty moose garage. I think he's got eight or nine MGAs. They're not all running. And uh, I, took, I took it out and got the, uh, uh, the wire mesh uh, that Moss sells. Uh, Clark and Clark uh, makes, ma makes that wire mesh. And you can really get a lot of air through your MGA. Further, if you've got an MGA and you can't get it to cool, take, you know, take it out for a run, come back, take the radiator out. Oh, that's easy to say. Uh, not the radiator, the grill, that's what I mean. Take the grill out and go out for another run. Do you drop, do you drop down to your thermostat setting? If you do, well, duh, you're not getting enough air through the radiator. If there is no change, then it's not the teeth in the grill. But I like the look of, the, of that um, stainless, that stainless uh, mesh. And uh, boy, you get a lot of air th through there. Judd, you're still running your original. Um, yeah, mine is what uh, we kind of call the pre-bashed. Uh, the Mark II had the inset uh, grill. <laughs> and I don't know, it's... Uh, half and half, probably 50% bars and 50% open space. And um, it doesn't look to me like it would cool as well as the TD or the MGB, but that car, either it's got a bad sending unit or it never overheats. <laughs> I um, wish I, I, I'm gonna go with the never overheats part. The, um... The mechanical gauges are, you don't need that expensive modern piece of, of um, equipment. All you have to do is unscrew the sending unit out of the head, put it into a pan, heat yeah. it up to oil with your propane torch and look inside and see is it reading 212 or, or what's the error. And I'm not sure the error is linear. Um, I mean, if it's off 10 degrees, there's off 10 degrees when it's reading you know, 160, I, I don't know, but you get an indicator of, of what, what's going on. I've got an old, old uh, electric little coffee pot thing that I drop it in and when it, it's boiling, uh, I'm 800 degrees, I mean 800 feet up, so boiling is 210 roughly, uh, and, and that's what I let it go at. Uh, do you know what the boiling point, is there a, a known number for, uh, 50 50 water, uh, 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 antifreeze. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure, I am sure that you can find that pretty easily. I'll look. I, I didn't look prior, prior to our, our meeting tonight. 20 degrees extra temperature. What, what's much? there, Barney? Yeah, that's me. 50 50 antifreeze will give you 20 degrees higher temperature before it boils. So sea level 235, uh, something like that. Oh, yeah, it's, on, the, uh, it's on the, read the damned instructions, Judge. <laughs> it's on the back of the antifreeze cap. <laughs> I'll look, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm done, John, thank you, wonderful. When, no. you put a, when you put a pressure cap on, temperature goes up three and a quarter degrees for each <clears> pound of pressure. The MGA wants a seven pound pressure cap that'll push it right up to 230 without boiling. And if you throw antifreeze in, it'll get you 250. <laughs> you can push that temperature all the way up to sort of 80 PSI. Wow. Do you gain anything by running hotter? I mean, I'm not a racer, I'm just a tourer. No, they like to run at at least 180 degrees minimum. Yeah. But, uh, for efficiency, anything you get 160, 165, they're too cold, and that's hard on the engine. Washes oil off the cylinder walls, too much fuel, had to, you know, run a rich mixture to make it work. So it's not good to run it cold, but 180, 185 minimum is really good. 
I got a 180 thermostat in mine and it runs at 190 absolute minimum once the thermostat is open. It's usually 195, 200 on a warm day. What I, what I didn't mention before, and, I, and you just made me think of it, was that um, if, if your car is in fact overheating, uh, it might be overheating because that ratio, that third, third, third ratio of heat um, heat in the exhaust, heat in the radiator, and energy at the flywheel is wrong. And the most common reason to be wrong is because the engine is timed incorrectly. So if you get the timing right, 32 degrees before top dead center, full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected, then you're doing it as well as you can. Um, so. well, we're going to come down here to Tom who asks about radiator hoses. What about silicon hoses? What about rubber hoses? I, I don't know. Um, Tom, are you on? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted your opinion as to, I see silicon being offered by a lot of vendors now. Is there any advantage to it or is it just something, um, I mean, just a new product? Let's see, what could they be? Uh, it's not originality. Um, there, are they slipperier? Does the water go through with less energy? So therefore more water can get moved through the system. Do they last longer? I don't know. I have not, I, I just don't even have a clue. Barney's going to weigh in. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the advantage is you don't have to use the $7 hoses that are guaranteed to fail in one year. You just have to find a good radiator hose. Don't buy the garbage ones. Okay. There used to be, back in the day, an aftermarket John Bull, B-U-L-L. -L. And those are great. They had a uh, like a canvas mesh over the hose. Oh my gosh, they looked, just, they looked extremely durable. And I know we were taking them off cars the, probably the last, the last day that, that I had my shop. Um, but the, the new stuff, just for whatever reason, I had a guy call me today and, and urge me to urge all of you not to buy any parts um, produced in China uh, for several reasons. Um, um, one, one of which is that uh, they, they do have foreign nationals in their jails that they're holding only because of leverage against other governments. But the other one is that some of the parts are so bad, but you know, Help me out if you see what appears to be the same hose in two different two different catalogs. Although now we only just have one, um, and one's twelve bucks and one's eight bucks. You're going to buy the one for eight. That's human nature. So that's why we have a problem with the with the quality. One of the problems. Anyway. Hey John, this yeah. is this is Albert. Um, yes sir. Hey, I've um, spent thirty seven years working at a radiator shop. Um, seen a lot of silicone hoses and other types of hoses. The silicone hoses are more oil and grease resistant, so they don't break down to the oils and things, which in key areas like trucking, where you have a lot of blow by, that makes the life of the hose a little longer. But one of the key problems with the silicone hose is they cut easy. And when you use a traditional worm clamp on the hose, you cut into the hose. So you need a special hose clamp that's got a collar all the way around it or a heat shrink hose clamp, spring clamp, but a traditional wire or um, screw hose clamp is not good on a silicone hose. Um, it's more money. Uh, they do last longer, but for what we do in these cars, it's not necessary. Um, a good traditional rubber hose um, of a good quality is fine, but silicone has its advantages in certain applications, but um, I don't see it justified in ours because they do cut easy. Wrong clamps will mess them up. Um, so there's little advantage to our application. Let, let me ask you a question, Albert. Um, the, the older radiators, the original radiators are very heavy. Um, I, I mean, compared to what? Compared to the new radiators. Mm -hmm. And my gut just tells me that since they're both, both made out of brass or appears to be brass, um, that if the radiator isn't as heavy, it's not as durable, and it won't last as long. Is that a reasonable approach? To take? Uh, yes, it is, but the advantage, along in the late 70s, 
we started seeing a change in the radiator in brass radiators I'm talking about, which is what we're talking about here, brass radiators. Right. So the fin material, um, when you have a flat fin, a fin that runs from side to side, that's called a plate fin. Then we went to serpentine fins, which everybody pretty much has today, where the fins fold back and forth between the tubes. So a plate fin radiator, the tubes go through the plate itself. So you have some protection on the tube on the outside from rock damage. If the fins fold down, you can bend them back up. Um, those are heavier gauge material. Well, just like anything, cast iron, if you heat up heavy, it takes longer to cool it. So if you make the product thinner, it'll dissipate the heat quicker. So then we went to serpentine fins, and then we went to serpentine fins with louvers inside, which you have to look really hard to see that, made even another 15% more efficient, but they're very thin. Um, they work well, but no, they do not last as long. They are more subject to road salt eating them away, um, damage easier. Um, so it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Yeah, they don't weigh as much. They cool better. They don't last as long. But the other you know, big factor is the lighter they are, the less copper is in it, the cheaper it is to make it. So it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. But yeah, the, the fin work and those radiators have gotten... Now, I still made radiators with heavy gauge fins for applications where it needs the durability. But today's environment, everything is just as thin as it can be to work as well as it can. And you throw it away and you buy another one. What's the, uh, what's the scoop with aluminum radiators? I, I started seeing right at the end of my time working every day. Um, I started to see those and, and they were in the magazines and stuff. And, and people always thought because they were aluminum that they cool better, but that didn't make any sense to me. Well, um, the aluminum radiators versus a, a traditional copper radiator, it will cool better not necessarily because the aluminum cools better, the copper will cool better. But the, the um, way they could funk, they can make an aluminum tube larger because of the, the flexing of the material, they can make it a little stiffer, the alloy that they made it with. So the aluminum cools well. Um, I've made aluminum radiators. It's, um, they're not my favorite. They're not as repairable. So that's a key thing, which you think, oh, it's new, it shouldn't need repaired. Well, I made my living doing things that shouldn't need to be done. Um, but the aluminum is lightweight. It's less expensive than copper. Uh, it does function well, um, but it's more prone to electrolysis, more prone to you know, leaking damage, um, but it functions and it's more economical. So really the reason you're seeing more aluminum is because it's cheaper to make. Um, that, that's the whole thing. It's just cheaper to make. Um, I like copper. Um, I've made one for my wife's car, uh, a little bit beefier one for her MGB, um, but yeah, copper's copper's good, but um, aluminum is um, cheaper, so that's that's the way the world rolls. I wouldn't um, had if I had my choice between aluminum or, or copper, I would always go with copper, um, just for the longevity and the repairability. Um, <coughs> but I can repair anything that can be repaired on aluminum radiator, but a lot of it you can't repair, so. Um, I'm staying with copper. Thank you very kindly. All right. Thanks. Hey, John. <clears throat> I'd like to put in a good word for the original cell core radiators that were native to MGAs. Those things cool like crazy. When MGAs were new, they just absolutely never, ever overheated. Today, everybody's complaining about MGAs running hot. And the first thing I ask them is, what kind of radiator do you have in it? Take the stupid recorded radiator out of there and put an original cell core radiator in it, even if it's 60 years old, and it will cool like a cucumber. How does the um, uh, guy that doesn't know anything about radiators tell which kind he has, Barney? Well, you can tell them by looking at the front. The uh, cell core radiator has what looks like vertical tubes, but it goes all the way from front to back. It's a water cell. It's made out of two pieces of brass or <clears throat> copper that are soldered together with three seams, front, center, and rear seam. If you look at it from the top, it looks like two tubes. And it's a serpentine shape all the way down, zigzag, 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 all the way down. And you can see this zigzag shape from the front. And when you look in between the vertical tubes, you have ribbon candy. It's one little fin that just goes back and forth and back and forth like ribbon candy between the fins. And once you know what you're looking at, you can spot these things from 10 feet away. It's real easy to see a cell core 
as opposed to a tube and fin radiators. Well, the tube, the tube and fin is like an MGB. You got, I mean, it's just absolute, uh, a series of, of horizontal lines. And when I got my radiator redone several times, my radiator guy's gone now, but um, he'd always say, oh, you want a heater core? I said, I don't, I just want to, all I wanted to do was look original. I didn't, I had no idea that, that uh, the cooling ability was greater than, than uh, anything else. I was just after, after the original look. And he yeah, said, that's a heater core. The cell core radiators have phenomenal cooling ability. When the water falls down through those tubes from top to bottom, it's very turbulent, it sloshes around the little eddies back and forth. <clears throat> the serpentine tube keeps mixing the water as it goes down. So you do not have any laminar flow. When you have straight tubes, you have laminar flow and you have the fins will cool the tube, but you got hot water going down the center and it just sort of stays hot in the center and doesn't cool so well. So you get these cell cores and it causes turbulence in the water as it goes down the tube and it makes a whole lot of difference. Thank you. Let's see, next up, Dean, how do I get permission to record when I press record? Well, I'm recording it, um, the session tonight. I don't know if I put up the last one yet on YouTube or not, but I'll put this one up, but I'm not sure. Ben Andrews. Hi, John, 74 MGB stored for five years, back on the road, new clutch installed with engine swap. Um, before, uh, before it was parked, the electric overdrive did not engage, but I have an issue of, a, of, of slipping in second gear. Did you mention that the cone clutch in the overdrive can cause slipping? Yes, I did. Or should I look purely at the clutch or sluggish slave for my issue? First, third, and fourth do, do not seem to slip. The reason it slips is because of the torque that you're putting on it. Um, sometimes it's really, really hard to tell, you know, but if, if it's slipping in all gears, um, let's see, when you're in overdrive, and it slips, then you know, and it doesn't slip when you're in direct drive, then you know that it's the cone clutch. But that's pretty odd because you got 450 pounds of pressure pushing against that cone clutch. And I know we had a couple of them in the shop over, over 40 years and it was like something slipping, which is slipping. And you gotta take the engine and gearbox out to change take the engine out to change either of them. We did have slipping clutches because the pressure plates were made incorrectly. We got like two of them in a row. Oh my gosh. And uh, it turned out that the, thru that the thrust plate, the plate that, that contacts the, the, um, the disc was set too far away from the engine. So the sandwiching effect wasn't as strong as it should have been. It took two or three clutches on a customer car to get that sorted out. If you're lucky, you get paid for the job you did. You hardly ever get paid for doing it again or again or again. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, Ben. It's, a, it's, it's um, you'd think that you'd have a problem in first gear, but it has to do with the torque difference. That's, that's what's going on. That's why it's short. And then the, um, a sluggish slave cylinder is really easy. You can hear it and you can feel it. When you dump the clutch, when you pop your foot off the clutch pedal, um, the rear wheels should, should bite. They should bite and, and if it's really, if it's a strong pressure plate and there's no restriction to getting the fluid out of the slave, um, it'll, it'll bark, it'll squeak. The rear wheels will slip on, on the pavement. I can do that with my MGA because I've got a real stiff pressure plate. And because my slave hose, it's never the slave cylinder, it's the slave hose, is able to get um, fluid down into the slave and back out again. So as long as it, it's feeling okay right when you take off, snappy, then you, you, you haven't got a problem with, with your clutch hydraulics. 
So I wish I could tell you more, but I can't. Ben, are you out there someplace? Unmute yourself, either hit the hit the space bar or, or uh, here we go, there's Ben, but we can't see Ben, he's hidden from view, but he's trying, I, I can see that you're trying there, but there you are, now you're unmuted, so. But we don't hear anything yet, so anyway. Call me, Ben. Call me tomorrow. Let me think about it a little bit more and see. Okay, from Ken, he's got a 1970 MG Midget uh, with a 1275 engine and a ribbed gearbox. He's got two questions, but there's only one of them here. So what, what, maybe they show up someplace along the way, but Ken, why don't you un unmute yourself and ask the two questions about your your gearbox. Okay, first of all, um, actually the question is not uh, not with the gearbox, you're just giving it a general description. If you scroll past uh, Pete and Greg's, my two questions are there, one is concerning the SU carb needle, and the other one is uh, about an oil leak that is from the trans. Uh, so let's maybe we talk about the trans first. Okay. So I've got a major oil leak from the trans, it appears to be from the rear of the trans, uh, it's not leaking from the drain or, or from the fill area. Um, I'm presuming that there is a seal at the rear of the trans. There is, and you can't, you got to pull it out. Okay. So that's, that's just the way it is. And so you, you take a chisel, sounds so crude, a chisel and a hammer and, and work around that seal because that seal is, is that long. It fits oh. over, over the end of the gearbox and uh, tap, 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 off it comes. And then when you put the new one on, put a lot of grease on it so it slips in and you use a socket that's large enough so that you can, you can catch the outside of it, tap, 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 and get it to go on, get it to go on nice and straight. So that's, okay. that's it. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's, that's real frustrating. Right. Um, oh, okay. No, that's, that's what's got to be done. It's got to be done. It's easy enough. Okay, and this is, um, a, this is a 1970 midget? Correct. So the SU carb needles are somewhat loose. That probably means they're spring-loaded. You can flick them back, back and forth. Right, yeah. That's, so that's for a later model midget. I don't know what those are doing on your, but that's okay. Um, so. Well, and yeah, my idle is kind of uneven. Um, you know, they have the same suction at idle. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have any vacuum leaks. And um, I thought part of the problem might be the floats. Well, I replaced the floats. Uh, the, actually, the originals were fine. They weren't leaking. Uh, everything seemed fine. Replace the pins and replace the floats. And it does idle better, no question. So this but I still get a variation of about 250 RPM. That's a, that's a vacuum leak. That's got to be a vacuum leak. All right. So, um, you've taken spray carburetor cleaner with a tube on the end of it. And you spray between the head and the manifold, the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and the spacer blocks, the spacer blocks and the carburetors around the top of the of the, of the intake manifold and around the throttle shafts. Okay. That's, yeah. that's where, where, where you'll find the vacuum leak. That's, a, that's just textbook case. Okay. It, it goes up to a, a spot where it no longer likes to run and falls back down. And then it, it just it, it just keeps, you know, re repeating the same Right, right cycle sometimes it's, you yeah. grab a hold of the carburetors just grab them and move them up and down and you go oh my god these things are loose yeah. and you just you wouldn't know there's a little insert in the intake manifold uh so that they, they won't leak as easily as they might other words mgbs mgas don't have those inserts but the midgets do right the, the only thing that i haven't spread are the throttle shafts i never thought about that and that's well, obviously a point they'd, of have to be, yeah. they'd have to be pretty bad, but let me tell you, I, I've rebuilt a lot of carburetors and a lot of a lot of throttle shafts are really bad. Okay. Um, but that's that's just that's that's got to be what what's going on. So again, the valve lash is twelve thousandths round there. The um, compression should be the same. You're running Champion N nine Y C's gapped at thirty five thousandths. Timing's 32 degrees before top dead center, vacuum disconnected, full mechanical advance. 
Okay. And of course, you can't see the timing marks are about, about as big as the end of my mechanical pencil. And they're folded underneath the timing cover. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's just nuts. There yes. you can make a, a case for putting a new timing mark, top dead center mark, um, where you can actually see it down past the alternator. Okay. That takes some fiddle around to do, a lot easier to do when the engine's out, like it's going to be pretty soon to change that rear seal. So put a new timing, put a new timing mark on the front cover. Right. And, and um, then, you, then, you know, it's either top dead center or 32 or make both of them there. And then, then you'll be able to use the timing light on. So. Great. Thank you, John. Hey, thank you. From Mike Vaidio, what should the temperature be for the exterior of the intake manifold at the base of the carburetor? What about the crossover tube? I don't know, 40 Fahrenheit? It's cold. It, well, the, my, my, uh, the intake right at the base of the carburetor is like near 200, and the crossover tube is 235. Is this, that's just you using the gun, right? The thermos, uh, thermometer gun. Yeah, and that's while it's running? Yeah, that's why it's, when it's hot. And running. Yeah. Okay. Because, boy, that evaporation, that just takes so much heat. Those carburetors, usually when you put your hand on them, not the full bowl, but, you know, the body itself, um, they're, they're cold, cold yeah. to the touch. Yeah, well, the intake, I'll t I didn't check that, but I, the intake manifold was hot. And, you know, the, uh, the crossover tube uh, between the two uh, intakes was like hotter than the other. Well, there's not, there's no air that goes through, through. I mean, there's just pulsing. There's sort of air that goes through there, but not, no, no move, real movement of air. So um, I would expect that to be, I mean, that sits right on top of the, of the um, exhaust manifold. So I would expect that the, from radiation, mainly maybe from convection, that would be very hot up there. Okay. okay. But I don't, I don't know what those temperatures would be. I, I've never measured them. Yeah, I, I was just curious with the, you know, that just seemed hotter than I expected because like you said, the evaporation, you know, so. All right, thank you. Yeah, we don't have carburetor icing like airplanes do. Although I did have a, I did have a customer about, oh, I don't know, maybe 1979 or something. And his wife drove from Grand Rapids to Kalamazoo every day. She got a master's or something rather at Western Michigan University. And there were times in the fall when um, she'd take her foot off the throttle. There was no change. There was no change in the throttle. And it was because the, the, um, uh, the throttle discs and ice stop, literally. The Ford Festiva, uh, which was a wonderful little car, had bad carburetor icing. I finally realized that it was because that heat tube that was supposed to prevent that wasn't there. On my 77 uh, 302 V8 Ford, the heat tube is there, and I've never had carburetor icing, but the old the, the standard American straight down draft will ice. I know from experience. That's you know I, without ever having checked the temperatures, I just know that you bump your hand against it, it's cold. You know on a T type, you know it's it's uh, the carburetors seem to sit out a ways or I don't know something, and um, maybe it's easier to touch those when you're tuning. But sometimes they they can be really really chilly. So Bill Califut says, how often should we flush the cooling system? If I can be smart, because when, when is the best, best time to plant a tree? 10 years ago, that was the best time to plant it. And the next best time is today. So we never ended up right towards the end of, of University Motors when I was running the shop. We had, we, we had a service we called a complete lubrication and we drained out everything. We drained out the, when you came in, we drained out the, the differential and the gearbox and the engine um, and refilled all that, refilled, blend the brakes, changed all those oils and stuff. We just at the end, we started talking about draining the cooling system as part of the complete lubrication, which is once every 12,000 miles, once every five years. 
But if you don't know the last time you changed it, it's probably time. And by flushing it, do you mean changing the fluid or do you mean actually pouring in some caustic soda and uh, burning the inside of the engine and inside of the radiator? I mean, just ch changing the fluid. And the other part of that question is, what's the best way to, like, just if you're just going to flush out the block, where is the best place to hook to and you know, drain and that kind of stuff? What year do you have? It's a 70B. Okay, well, um, you want to take the, the line off the heater control valve, and okay. you want to take the rubber line off the other end of the heater, and put your garden hose on the topmost, the return line, and put it on full blast and watch that orange shit roll out of that heater. Oh my gosh, it'll sometimes it'll run orange. Well, the garden hose, it'll run orange for 20, 30 seconds before it's all cleared out of there. So if that's been caught in the in the heater matrix, imagine what's in the engine. So you can't get to the engine very easily. That's the hard part. You know how do you how do you do that? So um, take the you know you take the, the thermostat housing right off. You know and and uh, when you go to put that back on, you always use grease on that gasket. Grease, 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 grease on the studs, grease on the gasket, grease on everything. If you put a new thermostat in, make sure that you drill an eighth inch bleeder hole in there for the air, because the new thermostats coming down through stant that fit our cars don't no longer have breather holes in them uh, for the for the air to get out. But um, I, you know that take the bottom take the bottom hose off. I you know I put the garden hose in there. I remember running engines. You know running the engines. Well um, well until so much water got on the distributor that they quit. But uh, running the engines with a garden hose into them. But okay but wherever you can get access. Sometimes the bottom radiator hose is all but impossible to get. Right, right. John, right. Uh, I used to put a uh, reverse flush kit from Prestone on the heater uh, heater hose coming out of the uh, control valve oh. and uh, run it and boy, this, and then it would come out of the top of the radiator and boy, the crap that came out of there sometimes. And, uh, haven't done that recently, but that seemed oh. to work pretty good. Yeah, okay. Wonder if you can even buy those today. I, I haven't. I, I've got a couple, but I haven't. Well, I haven't looked for them, so I don't know if they're there. Yeah. All right, we got Sean in Virginia. John, I really love your videos, especially the newest ones. Thank you. Last week, my dad gifted me his forty-eight TC. So I think we're going to talk about adoptions right now, and maybe his dad hasn't got enough kids. Maybe he's got more MGs. Um, anyway, he bought this. Uh, he bought this 48 TC in the 1960s. He drove it a few years and then stored it since 1971. So my 16-year-old son and I would like to get it back on the road after this nap. Oh my gosh! The engine turns freely. There, you got that. I'm assuming that there are a number of things that we need to got to do attention before we fire it up. And um, absolutely. So how would I approach this? Drain out the engine, the gearbox, and the differential, fill those, replace all the wheel cylinders. Now, you can either replace the wheel cylinders in the master cylinder, or you can have them resleeved. Um, there are a bunch of different companies that do re resleeving. I always use uh, um, white post, um, but there's other other places too. All new brake hoses, belts, cooling hoses, drain the gas tank. That's going to be one of the biggest hassles because there's going to be, chances are, there'll be chunks, chunks of dried gasoline in there. So then it's like, well, what do you do now? You can't buy another tank. We can, but they don't I don't know if you can or not, but um, the tank you've got is probably the, the one you want to keep. So you got to go to a radiator shop and ask them to take your tank apart, which means that they fill it with water, cut a hole in the back, oh yeah, and then and then mechanically clean it. I mean, the power washer or something or other on the inside, and get all the junk out of it, weld that back in, solder it, and then solder any leaks that, that they find. In this whole process, of course, you lose the paint. 
off the gas tank. So the cheap trick, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. You take the you take the uh, the drain the drain plug out of the center of the tank, and you take the filter screen out. But chances are there's there's stuff in there that that will not reduce uh, to liquid with modern gasoline. After you've done that, you get oil pressure. Spin it over without the plugs in it until you get some kind of oil pressure reading. Change the points. You don't have to change them, just clean them. Clean the points, gap them, time it. That information is in the TD workshop manual. You can call me tomorrow, I'll go through it with you. And uh, start it up. Just a couple months worth of work, that's all. So, um, so Sean, are you, are you on with us here? I am, yeah, thank you for that rundown. Yeah, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, that's probably what you're gonna do anyway, but yeah, as the brakes are the most important part, doesn't matter if the engine runs, only matters if it stops and steers, so. Yeah, Hope to cool. see you at the, at the Hunt Classic. Yeah, okay, well, maybe you'll have a car there, huh? That's a, <laughs> maybe. Well, you know, hey. Nothing that a MasterCard can't 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 fix, you know. You know. Oh my gosh, that's that's a nice story. Stored it since seventy one. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's really cool. Make sure that you enjoy before you. You know, I mean, you probably already know that you enjoy the car because you've had it and lusted after it for so long, and now it's yours, and and you're going to drive it no matter how it feels, but. If you have a chance to drive somebody else's TC, just go out and drive it first so that when you get into yours, you're not shocked, either because it's uncomfortable or because you can't, you, you can't hit one pedal at a time or the steering seems like, how can you even steer this? And of course, you don't steer a TC, you just aim it. But um, yeah, so. Yeah, don't, don't drive more than five miles on those tires. Get oh, rid of them. Tires. Excuse me, tires. Thank you. And that you're um, you're right there, right near Chattanooga. So they they got the tires there. So that'll only, that'll that'll set you back one one payment on your Mastercard the tires. So thank you. Okay. All right. So now we have um, Mr. Uh, eighteen one thirty eight, who asks, how full should the expansion tank be? So there's a couple different ways to go at it. One, you can just fill it up. And then the next two or three times that you turn the car off um, after a hard run, it's gonna burp out of there and go on the ground. And, and somebody's, if you're not at your own house or if there's someone else in charge of your driveway or how it looks, they'll be distressed. So, um, but that's an easy way to do it. And then it just eventually seeks its own level, but just offhand about two thirds full. I mean, just offhand. So. Yeah. Uh, all right, John, it's Steve from Florida. Yeah, Steve. How you doing? You helped me out with the uh, fuel pump that went bad after a couple months, about a month ago. Okay. My, uh, my MGB 77 was in the barn for 20 years. And I got out of the barn and like you said, all that stuff that he has to do, I did. I did replace the tank, though. That was important, but there was a lot of sludge in there. Well, with an MGB gas tank, you, you know, you order it today, you, geez, you can yeah. have it tomorrow. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I went, I went with the 16 gallon. Okay. So, so not, my, my guess is that the tank is larger than, than your bladder now. So, Probably. Most gas tanks are about bladder size. You can't, you, 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 we've got to stop before you need gas. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. John? So, yes. Let me make a statement here. Um, I actually had to get a new gas tank for my TB. Okay. They're not cheap, but they are available. Approximately, what is that, 1200 bucks? Yep. Ouch. Okay. So they, they are available. Did that come through one of the major suppliers? Um, up from the frame up. Oh, okay. All right. That, there's a guy in England that makes them. And uh, it, you know, popped right back in. Wonderful. I went to have the original uh, leaked and they blew it up and gave it back to me. So I had to buy a new one. 
So, mm -hmm. um, but they're not cheap, but they are available. Okay. So Sean, you got lots of options here. I'm, I'm always game for the least expensive, you know, cheapest, quickest thing first, but sometimes you, you, you cannot get there. Or in modern, modern language, people say throwing good money after bad, but there's no such thing as bad money. I, I never found any bad money. Anyway, um, of course, that's not what, what they mean. Um, it's, uh, it's just gone nine. I've got to make my unabashed plea again uh, to, to invite you to go look at my website. There is a resource page on there with a lot of stuff in there about who sells this and who can rebuild that. That's handy information. There's also some technical information. Not a, it's a spec compared to what Barney Gaylord's got on his site on mgaguru.com. But I do have some information on my site. But <laughs> that little that little um, yellow PayPal button. And if you'd be so kind when you're thinking of me, thinking of this session and all that you learned, go to the go to the uh, universitymotorsltd.com, find that PayPal button that says help John afford his retirement and uh, make a make a contribution. I'd be very kind. John Tershak, should all um, I think you're asking here, should all MGAs have a radiator fan shroud? John, can you hear me? Yes. No, they, they all do. You're freezing. Um, I'm, uh, no, I, I, would just, I, I was just quiet for a second, I think. Um, um, so there's a, there are fan shrouds that you can get that you can put on an MGA aftermarket ones. No, John. No, every MGA has a shroud on it. That extension that it has two purposes on your radiator. One is to hold your bonnet up with the rod and that piece that extends over that fan, that is considered part of the shroud. Okay. If uh, when I was when I was down in North Carolina, where it's a lot hotter on the beach, uh, what I used to do to keep that engine dropping down 10 degrees is the uh, 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 the boxes you got from the post office had that little sticky on there. I used to cut off about two or three inches to stick it on the end of uh, that shroud on the top to go ahead, and it would bring my cooling down about 10 degrees on that. Okay. On that part, there's a part on the bottom about uh, where I was talking. You were talking about coolant on there for the keep on there. Well, on the antifreeze, they've changed. The manufacturing has changed on the color. We used to get the green for ours, and now they're just putting on everything, and they're using a yellow. that is used for all types, but it's not. It's only for the cars that are in the mid 80s and above. That's what they consider as the older cars. On um, uh, Napa has a green uh, antifreeze. It's about $12 and some cents for a gallon straight. You know, you have to mix your own. And uh, that's for our cars and it is green, but the life expectancy of that antifreeze is only two years, is what they tell me on that. Okay, that goes back to our earlier question about how often should you flush your system or change change yeah. change your coolant. Yeah. Well, I, another thing too, when I did it, I did a reverse uh, flush on my MGA, and what I did is I took the thermostat out of that, and I've got a. Uh, a pipe rigged up so I can just go ahead and hook it up to my garden hose and just flush it that way out. It works mm -hmm. out pretty good. Now I have one question for you now. Sure. On that is on the dizzy. So we were talking about on the MGBs about having the uh, Jeff going ahead and set it up at a certain year. I think it was in 69, 70, something like that. Why can't you just take a uh, distributor, uh, MGB, distri say MGG distributor 
from say a 69 and just stick it in a, a uh, B engine? You can. Say a you can. You can. You can take you can take a distributor out of a Mini or an Austin Marina, or uh, lots and lots of vehicles. But you're looking for, and if you time it at 32 degrees, you know that you're 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 not yeah. under or over advanced when you're running full speed. But if you want the proper um, the proper timing at the proper time, it's that earlier in the MG in the MGBs, the 62 through 67 distributor that they used all the way through about 78 in England. They put it in a 45D and called it a 41427 instead of the 40897, but it had the same advance. It had a it it, it, it didn't have a symmetric cam and had an asymmetric cam of the points that they used in a bunch of stuff but the the advanced curve was the same so that was used um in a lots of different markets um but not in the united states so the advantage to having a distributor made for your car is that you know it, it's going it's going to perform better than something else I, I mean let me tell you there's so many different <laughs> so many different distributors that'll fit in there from everything. The only thing that won't work in there very well is a six cylinder distributor yes, and a four. But I was talking to Calvin Dodd at Moss and some guy called up and he was try, having trouble making his car run and, and Calvin's telling them stuff about the distributor and it just, it just, a lot of the stuff just isn't making any sense. So the guy finally sends Calvin a, a picture of the distributor and it's an eight cylinder distributor. And he just, you know, they, there's a wire that came off every other, every other spot on the cap, you know? And so it ran, it didn't run well, um, but, but it ran. So yeah, you can use any distributor to get you going. All right, so seven is one of the you, you're always best to use the use the a, a rebuilt a really good distributor. I, I go back to that same old thing. The engine block is, I mean, how many shoe boxes is an engine block? It's a great huge piece of equipment, and yet equal equal in importance to that are the carburetors, and those are are at least as big as two fists, maybe as big as three fists, and there's two of them, and then you get to the distributor, which is an equal member of this whole system and it's only as big as one fist so it's 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 um it's doing three things timing this timing the spark uh making the spark and distributing the spark and they just they wear out so and the new ones that come from from the country that's brought us so many wonderful things lately um those are not consistent. The advanced curve isn't consistent on those. And who knows what the advanced curve is? I mean, you can put it in your car and, and figure it out, but you can't change it. Again, the new one, time it at 32 and you're all right, but um, maybe it's too far advanced when you're running at 2000 RPM. Maybe it's woefully retarded at 2000 RPM, so. Thank you. Hey, thank you. All right, back to Ben Andrews. Coolant topic. What is a good laser temp reading at the block or the cylinder head? Well, I, I, would, I would say the whole system ought to be consistent and it ought to be, well, Barney was telling you 180, I'm telling you 195, so split the difference, you know? Um, you know, it, it all ought to be about the same. If you, if you let that um, laser temp, that um, pyrometer, uh, come up against the exhaust manifold, well, then you're at 550. There's serious, serious difference in temperature there, but um, the, the whole, the block ought to be even all, all the way across. That's the reason that there's a bypass in the, in the cylinder head on the MGB engines, A engines, the B series engine. Uh, that's why there's a bypass between the water pump and the cylinder head on the A series engines. And that's why there's a bypass that's done externally with the T-type engines, so that before the thermostat opens, the water can still circulate. The water pump's still moving the water. You don't want one part of the water to get really hot and the other part of it to be stone cold. You want the whole engine to warm up as a unit, warm up evenly. So, 
That's my take on it. Okay, from Pat G. So Pat G, you can unmute yourself if you're if you're here. Have you seen late MGBs with the twin electric cooling fans where the fans change their direction of rotation? Yes. I've seen them going, both of them going the wrong way. I've seen both of them going the right way, and I've seen them going in a circle. But that's not because the fans change their direction. Um, it's because the fans are hooked up wrong. Most, I, as far as I know, all of them are permanent magnet motors. Um, and permanent magnet motors will run in one direction, hooked up plus and minus, and then you flip it around to minus and plus, and they'll spin in the opposite direction. So just because the motor comes to you with a plug on the end doesn't mean it's all set to go. You got to pay attention to it. And the cooling fans originally fitted to the MGB run anti-clockwise. As you see them running, the engine, as you're looking at the front of the engine, the engine's running clockwise, but the fan motors are running anti-clockwise. But then of course it depends on, on, on the pitch of the pitch of the blade, but I don't think I've ever seen a blade in the opposite pitch. So, and just because you put a fan on backwards doesn't mean that it won't, that it blows air in the opposite direction. Still blows it in the same direction, just not as efficiently. You see a lot of MGA cooling fans on backwards. So it, it just, um, I, it's off subject, but you know, if you cup your hand and you put it in a sandbox, you, you can get a lot of sand out on the back of your hand, you know, if you're trying to move some sand. But if you scoop it, you get a whole lot more sand. That's the difference with the, with the curves and the blades. You just have to look at the blades and you can see the, the um, uh, leading edge is always feathered. And there's a difference between MGA and MGB cooling fans, the, the steel ones. The plastic ones you really can't get on wrong. Um, you can get anything on wrong, but, but uh, anyway, I haven't seen the fans where they've changed their direction of rotation themselves. So I would say, Pat, have you? But is Pat here? We've run him off. All right, here we go. Next one up here is from iPhone. My 74 MGB has about 70,000 miles since the engine rebuilt. I'm currently getting 50 PSI oil pressure. It's too low. Any value to shimming? changing or shimming the oil pressure valve to improve the oil pressure. Absolutely. The oil pump's stupid. The bearings are stupid. The only thing that has any intelligence in there is the oil pressure relief valve. And that is designed to blow off at a certain pressure. The more shims you put on the spring, the stronger the spring is, the higher the blow off pressure will be. You don't want the blow off pressure to be 300 pounds because then you'll blow the oil filter off the, off the housing. But 75 pounds going down the road, a hot August day idling at 600 on a hot asphalt pavement in a parking lot, it can fall down to 10 pounds, five pounds. Doesn't make any difference. As long as the instant you touch the throttle, it, it jumps, jumps right back up to the blow off pressure. So um, I would um, change the oil pressure relief valve on the side of the block um, is a project. So taking it out is easy. You get an inch wrench, an inch socket, unscrew it, pops right out, easy as pie. So then there's a spring in there and you can measure the spring. I think that's supposed to be 3.0 inches, I think. So you can buy a new spring if you want. There's supposed to be a shim inside the valve. It's often not there on a rebuild because you just didn't, you bought a new valve and you didn't know there's a shim in there anyway. So you can buy the shim or you can just take a quarter inch helical lock washer, take two pairs of pliers and twist the helix out of it so it's flat. That's the same size as the spacer. Put one inside the valve and then one inside that cap screw that goes into the side of the block. Now you got two of them. The springs crunch down, it's going to give you a higher blow off pressure. 
that's not the problem. The problem is getting that cap back into the engine with the exhaust in place. Even if the exhaust is off, it's a task. So let's assume you're right-handed. You find yourself underneath the, the engine where it's most comfortable and you've got the spring in your left hand and you take the cap, which has got grease inside it in that spacer. Um, grease is mechanics glue, it's great stuff. It'll hold that in there for a long time. And you put that up there and you turn, you rotate, you rotate that cap just until it starts. You take it out and put it back in and start it. Take your hand off it, okay, it started there. Take it off, keep practicing so you know exactly where in rotation those threads grip. You have to know exactly where that is and you gotta feel it. So once you're sure you know where it is, you've done it three or four times and the threads start each time, then take it out, put the spring in there and you've got about, if you got a normal, a normal wrist, you got about two tries before you have to take a break for 15 minutes um, and put that cap up there and push it into place, rotate it, catch the threads. You're home free. And then just take your inch wrench, your socket and tighten it up. You cannot turn it and walk it around trying to find where it's going to start. You can't, you're, you haven't got enough strength in your wrist. And it's because this exhaust is in the way, even when it's up on the bench, even on the bench, it can be a, a bugger when that when that spring, trying to get that spring in there. So that's the hassle, doing the whole thing. Now there are adjustable oil pressure relief valves made for T types. It's a wonderful cottage industry to make one for an MGB. All you got to do is take that original cap, drill it, um, tap a quarter twenty eight. Put a, put a quarter 28 bolt in there, um, weld a nut on the end. You got some problem, you don't want the oil to wick out of there, which it'll want to a little bit. It's not, there's no pressure on that end, but if there's lots of oil in there, so it'll wick out. Um, and then you can adjust that, crank it up to 90, crank it down to 40, wherever you want it. So it's a nice little cottage business for somebody that wants to, to do those. If you want to call me tomorrow, I'll tell you what my idea is. I made one once for a for a uh, um, for an Austin America, which is uses the A series engine, but it's the same oil pressure relief valve. John, before you move off that, yeah. Before you move off that um, that topic, uh, I've got a fifty one MGTD. Um, the oil pressure is sensed at the head, not at the block. I'm getting about 30 PSI, oh, excuse me, uh, about 40 PSI at the head. Is it true that you would gain about, about 20 PSI if it was sensed below? Yes. More importantly, it's accurate. At the top end, it's like, what is it really? What is it really? But if you sense it at the bottom end, you, your, your chance of getting a, a, a more accurate reading is a lot better. That's why they moved the pickup down there I don't know when, around 52, late 51, they moved the pickup down to, to the bottom. And you can do that too, but it involves moving that intermediate brass piece. And you got plenty of plenty of length of the for the copper line that goes from the gauge to that intermediate piece on the firewall. And um, I don't know if you can get a long enough oil pressure hose if there's another application for one. Um, maybe a TC one, maybe, and we wouldn't have to, to move that intermediate piece, but we always did, did that. We always, whenever we did a rebuild, we always put the, the sensing um, the, at the bottom. And then also you can take the bolt that goes in the top. You can do this now with the way it's set up now, or you can do it um, after you've moved it and tap the inside of that banjo bolt, quarter 28, get a holly jet that's about, I don't know, around 50, 55, 60 thousandths. That's got a 32 thread per inch pitch, quarter inch, but it's brass and you can screw it in there into the quarter 28 with no problem. That grossly reduces the amount of oil that goes up into the, into the um, valves, into the valve train on the T-type. There's plenty of oil up there, oh my gosh. 
It's just, I mean, all you do is take the oil, take the valve cover off while it's idling, and you're, it's immediately obvious that there's plenty of oil up there. So you can reduce it quite a lot. And that will also, um, it'll not only indicate higher, it'll actually raise the oil pressure in the engine because you're not wasting so much going up to the valve train. So, so those are all some, some ideas on that, John. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, Peter Kershaw, I have a question regarding a Weber carburetor installation on a 78B, but where is the question? Um, I'm so, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't state okay. the question. That's okay, so what's up? What are you doing? All right, so it's really a quick question. I, I'm fairly new to this. Uh, again, appreciate all your videos and stuff. And I've probably had the B for, you know, about a couple months. I'm tinkering with it, got the thing running, I've been down the road in it, you know, doing a lot of work to it. Definitely have an issue with the idle. Um, I think I'm dealing with maybe a vacuum issue, but I, I really went after the, the idle mixture and the idle speed screw. Now the idle speed screw was really cranked in and I was able to get it down to about, you know, 15, 1700 RPM. I started thinking about the idle mixture screw, but you know, I don't think that's it. But, but my question is, is the orientation of this carburetor, the idle mixture screw and the idle speed screw are all facing the valve cover. If I had to adjust those anyways, I have no idea how I would. Um, I have a Weber DGAV, which is the water operated choke. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to go after the vacuum leaks, but is that the right orientation for that carburetor? Um, if, you, if you can make it work the other way around, then anything you're doing to it is so much easier. Yeah. Almost always, whether it's electric choke or water choke, almost always that stuff is all buried. You know, you're looking over it. It's up there about one o'clock and you need yeah. the world's second shortest screwdriver to adjust the, the trim screw and all that stuff. It's just a horror yeah. Try, yeah. trying to adjust the idle. Are you kidding me? So right. anyway, I have seen them spun around the other way, which makes more sense to me. But there's a, there's another logistical problem there too. I don't know whether it's the prowl cable or there's yeah. something. So anyway, the reason yours is idling at, at well over a thousand RPM, would you say 15, 1700 RPM? Yeah, yeah. and actually af after a ride, when I come back, it's right at two grand. I mean, I just, you know, yeah. So it's, it's, it's not the timing, it's not the gasoline not the tire pressure, it's air getting into the engine. So where's the air get, getting in? Well, the, the most common place, of course, is through the throttle discs because the throttle disc is, is not closed all the way. Now, do you have a, is that a progressive carburetor? The one, one, uh, one barrel opens and then it gets to a certain degree and then the, the other one opens? Summer, yep. summer. I'd have, yeah, I'd have to open the, I think they open at the same time. I'd have to look at it while I, yeah. while I increase the throttle, but. Anyway, um, something's up. Either either the screw that is attached to the to the water choke is holding it open. Something's okay. bent on the linkage. But those those throttle discs. I mean, when you're shut okay. down all the way, those throttle discs should be so tight that you can't okay. get a, a piece of paper between the between the the uh, throttle body and the and the copper um, rectangles there. The the butterflies. Um, so that's the first thing. And sometimes it's something as stupid as the throttle cable. You know, you, you got the thing all set up and, and you just made the throttle cable too tight. You know, yeah. so make sure there's some free play in the throttle cable. After yeah. that, then you need a can of spray carburetor cleaner with a, you know, with a um, tube out the, out the end of it and spray between the head and the manifold the manifold and the whatever spacers or, car or gaskets are between there and the and the carburetor, anything around there, even between what uh, even between the brake master cylinder and the booster, because if you've got an air leak coming through the through the um, um, power brakes, that will also in increase the RPM. Usually, it makes it run real shitty because it's the air is only getting to one side of the manifold or the other. What, uh, what kind of exhaust manifold do you have on this? Do you have the original exhaust manifold that's been cut off or what? I, know, I have a reason to believe um, it's, it's all original. 
I have no reason. It doesn't look like it's been jury rigged or anything like that. Or um, you can always um, you can send me a picture of it tomorrow on, on my yeah. phone. Yeah, uh, certainly, absolutely. And, and I, I can tell you just a little, little bit more about it, but but it's it's air getting in there somehow. So yep. you can put your hand. You take the air cleaner off. You can put your hand on one throat. Kills it. Well, geez, must be that throat. Put your hand on the other throat, doesn't do anything. Put your hands on both throats, block off the air, still running fast. Well, then it's not because the throttle disc is open, it's because of some air leak someplace else. Yeah. And you only need a pinhole leak. I mean, let me tell you, idle is a, idle is a real horrible place to make the engine run. It's real difficult to make them run there. It's amazing they all run as well as they do. Um, yeah. And you, all, you, all you need is just a pinhole leak, and it'll it'll dramatically affect the idle. What is, what is a, a good idle speed? I've done a lot of reading, researched, obviously your stuff. I mean, is whatever you know, race cars idle at thirty five hundred RPM. <laughs> um, uh, you know, MGC is with an automatic. If you've got the idle anything above six hundred, you can't press on the brake pedal enough to keep it from creeping at the stop sign. Wherever okay. it's comfortable for you. Okay. okay, and yeah. that means that when you when you um, go to take off, you don't you don't kill the engine. Yeah, so sure. so. that you've got to have enough inertia in the flywheel to, to get some launch speed. So sometimes yeah, it's, it's, it, it sounds, sounds good, or if I can get it down to around a thousand, really. Sound. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the normal that's idle is around eight hundred. I mean, that's okay. that's what we all look for, sort of. But some people can, you know, if you open up the valves to forty thousandths. You can have that thing tick over at 450 RPM. So yeah. you know, it just it just depends. Okay. Very okay. Good. Thank you very much. Good luck. Bob. Bob. Uh, from what you said, should I change my thermostat from 180 to 195? There's a reason that I'm asking. So Bob, are and you I still on? Yeah, and I just, I misspelled there. <laughs> it's Bob and Gloria. Uh, well, first of all, my, my bee's got an aluminum radiator, a 12 inch puller fan, and uh, it, it runs cool. It, it, we went across the Mojave Desert two years ago. It hit 116 degrees. My needle never went off the end. I'm running a 180 thermostat. However, driving around here in Ohio and 80, 80 plus, my temperature is maybe um, almost a quarter inch below the, the end. And it, it, to me, it seems like it's running too cool. But, well, again, but it's, it's probably not even opening the thermostat. That's the problem. Oh, no, no, that thermostat's got to got to be, I mean, that, that the engine's making too much heat. You can't, it's, if the thermostat, no, that I'm sure. But it, it, it doesn't have an absolute open and closed. It'll it'll float back and forth. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a firm believer that that the hotter it is, the better it runs until it gets to the point where it, it doesn't run right because it's too hot, because it boils the gasoline. Um, so I I put a 195 in Ohio. I put a 195 in there. Yeah, we even raced up uh, my friend with the MGC two years ago. We raced up that 11,000 foot mountain pass and on Route 40, and boy, neither one of us in Colorado was, and neither one of us had a heating problem. We went all the way to the top. It was so we're, and we both have aluminum radio. In fact, I bought it from him. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy that. The other thing I had, you were just talking about the Weber carburetors. Mm -hmm. the guy wanted us to work on his DR7, and he he put two Weber carburetors on it. I could. He was idling at 3,000 RPM. I got it down to two. I sprayed all over looking for a vacuum leak. I think the part of the problem is I noticed a rebuild kit box. He might have rebuilt the carburetors himself when he put them on. And I'm thinking I'm just about to tell him to put the Zena straw marks back on. Like, like I, I always remember what you said about Weber makes good grills. Okay. No. <laughs> I don't know why he put those on there, but all you have to do is misplace the throttle disc. Just get it a little. You know, a little kicked so uh -huh. that when it's closed, it isn't. You know, I mean, it, it comes to it comes to rest, but it's not it's not closed. So um, 
And that, I mean, that just wreaks havoc. But again, you, you can use that tube, the listening tube. You can listen and, and see if, if um, are those side draft levers or down draft levers? Down draft. Yeah. Down draft. And so, and there, two there's barrel, two, both two of them. Barrels. So just listen, you got four barrels. So you can listen to, into each barrel. You know, who yeah. knows what, what, what's good? What are you guys doing work on a trial? Anyway, well, um, I felt sorry for the guy. <laughs> I didn't want to take the job, and I'm sorry I did, and I'm going to tell him put the other carburetors on. Um, that's, so anyway, that's, you, you can listen, but there, it's, it's just a mechanical thing. I mean, you can find it. The other thing, you meant, when I mentioned the um, reverse flush kits, I just saw them on Amazon for $3.34, press stone. So if anybody wants one, but I, um, instead of, I, I had the tea fitting in, I took that out and I put a, um, a heater control valve from a Bronco, 70 Bronco. I get more heat, it flows yes. better, and my and heater control valve doesn't leak anymore. And it shuts off when you actually shut it off? It's easier to, off and on, it's easier. To, you have to make a little adjustment, drill a little hole because they work in reverse. Okay. So it's got a like a, a cross piece and a post. So I just went to the other side, drew a, I drilled an eighth inch hole, put the wire in there. Beautiful, absolutely. Well, there are there are improvements. I mean, I mean, the last MGB made was forty one years ago. So um, there are improve. There are most definitely improvements. So you've always I, got that same argument going on of form and function. Yeah. Well, I talked to them at, at Moss Motors. I talked to the one guy. He says we don't get any complaints because I. Put, but every year I'm changing the heater control valve. Well, he doesn't get any complaints because people don't drive as much as we do. So <laughs> might be 15,000 miles a year on and, and somebody else might take them 10 years to get that. So, well, the, uh, the, uh, the magnets, the magnets just had a pipe that came out there and because the valve, the valve was at a, a different location. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots I've seen. I, I mean, I, I've seen, um, <laughs> I've seen a hardware store uh, a tap with a with a, uh, yes. a red red handle on it, you know, which is yeah, we saw that, we've seen that. <laughs> My friend Ed did that to his car. Well, I, you know, that's what's on a 1275 midget, you know. I mean, it, it's screwed into the head into an aluminum housing that corrodes and warps. Um, so anyway, in the in the yeah, anyway, so I'd go with 195. Okay, thanks. Good Appreciate idea. that. Thank you. Okay, from Pat G, airflow in a radiator is only about 40 miles an hour. Okay, but it can't be 40 miles an hour, you mean maximum? Pat G, you still on here? How do you know, how do you even know that? I didn't read anything about radiators be, before I came on. I, there's probably a way that you rate radiators as far as their ability to transfer heat. And there's a, probably a lot of, a lot of stuff but I only know M MG ones. So, so Pat G, Pat G isn't here. So anyway, but Pat G says that the airflow in a radiator is only about 40 miles per hour. Okay, from Rod, um, I've got a 74 MGB Roadster uh, and we, University Motors rebuilt the top end many years ago. Um, I parted out a 71. It had an overdrive. Will the 71 overdrive work on my 74 Roadster? Yes. Yes. Yep. Just change the whole gearbox. It's just fine. Now, if the 74 is a 74 and a half, it's got a side fill. So you don't have to reach through the passenger compartment and, and drool oil all over the passenger footwell. When you're trying to get oil into the gearbox, why well, I hope that, that that must have been the same guy that moved the timing marks from six o'clock up to eleven. Um, um, anyway, if you want to combine those two gearboxes and you've got a side fill or a side fill available to you, go for that. It's a whole lot nicer than, than that that dipstick. So, is there a place that he can send the transmission to have it rebuilt? The only place I know who does gearboxes, and I would not separate the overdrive from the main box, um, either before or after. Um, the, the only people I know right now that are doing that are 
uh, John Esposito at Quantum Mechanics, and he's in what, New Hampshire, Connecticut, someplace. Um, long way from, from where we are. It's a big, big piece to ship. I think Bob Forsblum was doing some in Columbus, Ohio, but I don't know of anybody else. I do them. I do them in a minute. I'd love to do them, but I got, I got, I've got, I've got a car in my, sh I got two cars in my shop right now. The one that's been there for, it'd be embarrassing to say how long and and another one that I've got to get back yet uh, the next month or so. So I, I just can't do it. I'd love to do them. Love to re I love rebuilding gear gearboxes. So what about Forrest at uh, uh, Rusty Moose Garage? Maybe. He doesn't like to do bench work because he can't test it. Maybe Paul Deershaw at Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado. Maybe Glenn Lenhard at Glenn's MG Service in St. Petersburg. So anyway. Or maybe yourself, or maybe, maybe we can have a technical seminar at your house and I'll come down and in a matter of two, two days, we'll do it. But we've got to get some other people to come along <coughs> and drink beer and hang out, so. All right, so I'm gonna mute everybody here because we've got some background noise and I'm going to go to Hilliard Cracker. Uh, so this is his first meeting. He hasn't got the audio figured out yet, but he purchased a 79B. It has an engine cooling fan, like my old 68, as well as electric fans, which are not working. So he had a 79B with a cooling fan that if it's like the 68, now it's what? Six inches away, eight inches away from the radiator. I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, if the car had air conditioning there in that air conditioning package, there was um, an extra spacer for the thermostat housing to, to lift that top rad hose up. And a, I got my daughter, it's, I don't own a cat, but I got my daughter's cat here. Point, get up. Um, the air-conditioned cars had a huge white cooling fan on, on them that did sit close to the radiator with a shroud. Um, but I would, um, uh, anyway, um, Hilliard says that he's in South Carolina, so Judd, you got to make contact with him. And, and uh, he said he hasn't got any cooling problems so far. That's because those late model Bs cool so well. Um, but I would, I, I ditch the engine fan and put the electric fans on, but that's, that's just me. So but if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. You know? Okay, from Dean. In, in reference to the above um, recording, where does it record? To the computer or download maybe? Um, so, Dean, I'm recording it. I'm the host. I record the meeting. I don't know if anybody else can. Don't know. Um, it is being recorded. I record all the meetings. And I will put it up on YouTube. Um, so all of them, except maybe the last sem uh, session that, that we had, is up on YouTube. So... All right, so here we go from Bob to everybody. He said he did not have good luck with, Kev with Kevlar radiator hoses uh, from Moss. That's all he's got to say. Bob, are you there? Can you say what, what problem you had with those? Or yeah, They Kevlar split on the seam. They split right on the seam. They only lasted about six months, and they were more expensive than the rubber ones. So they were essentially worthless, I thought. Are those are those what we would call silicone ones? Is that is that what the guys? It might it might be also that, but it, it was advertised to have Kevlar, you know. And I mean, unless you're going to shoot a bullet through, through your radiator hose, it just yeah. wasn't worth it. Like a Kevlar vest, sure. Okay, all right. Yeah. I, hey, you know, you know that they buy that stuff in good faith and they sell it in good faith. And sometimes the stuff they have that they're selling, they don't find out for a long time afterwards. And you have to, if, if the part doesn't work, you have to complain or they don't know that there's a problem, so. 
I don't even know if they still sell it, but it split right on the seam after about six months. So I just threw them away and put the rubber ones back on, and they work fine. That's why you always carry duct tape in the car. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all right. So Pat G says silicone hoses are better. First used by cop cars, but they're slippery. So get them tight. So, oh my gosh. So if a police car uses a silicone hose, we should too. That's, there's a whole section in the front of most MG catalogs that have a lot of race car parts in them. Most of them do not belong on your, on your car. Um, they don't make your car go better necessarily. So they may help a race car, but most of us don't drive a race car. Uh, Rodney, Rodney Sheets. Hey, Rodney, how you doing? Uh, great feedback on the hoses. And okay, so here we got uh, from Richard. Thoughts on high temp reading, 79 uh, MGB with Zenith Stromberg and emissions intact. Did my first oil and coolant change. Don't know what fluids were used by the previous owner. I used VR1 2050 uh, with an STP S3600 filter. I don't, I don't know that one. And AutoZone conventional antifreeze at 50%. Also put in a new thermostat. When I did the coolant change, I thought the heater valve was open, but discovered later the cable was seized and left it closed. My first trip out, I ran maybe five miles and the temperature sensor on the radiator blew out. The question goes on, but let's answer that one first. Remember that I said that the new stamp thermostats um, don't have a, a, a tickler in them. They always used to have a tickler and, and uh, you can replace the tickler with an eighth inch hole. You got to drill that hole in the disc of a new thermostat. Why? Because if you don't, you put water in the radiator, it goes into the radiator, and, and then it forces the air in the engine up against the thermostat, which is closed. The radiator's full, but your engine isn't. So as soon as it starts to run, then there's not even near, there's not anywhere nearly enough coolant in the system, and the system immediately overheats, pressurizes, and blows out the temp sensor. So anyway, now he goes on to say he secured that with tie wraps and topped up the coolant. Now my coolant temp sits right around the bottom of the red line on the gauge. The oil pressure is 75 to 80 pounds. Prior to the coolant oil change, I think both were closer to the center. At least I didn't notice them. Um, and is the oil pressure too high? No, it's great, it's perfect. Although oil runs considerably um, cooler than the coolant does, if you take your pyrometer and shoot the well, shoot the oil filter, for instance, uh, you might find that that's uh, you know the coolant's running at 190, and the um, oil's only 135 or something. Um, so when the oil gets hot, it gets thin. You don't want thin oil. So the fact that your your oil pressure is high means that it's not so hot that it's getting thin. That's good. Um, thoughts on the coolant. Should I drain and refill with the heater uh, open this time? So anyway, um, uh, let's see, this is a, just a minute, I got to go back, a 79 MGB. So again, it's essential that you fill the coolant system, you know, through that it was originally a plastic plug. Most of those have failed, broken, and popped off. Um, and re have been replaced by a, a brass plug, which is the same brass plug as is used as a drain plug in a TD. It's got a half inch BSP uh, thread to it. Anyway, that's, that should be a brass plug up on top, not plastic. You fill it through there. And once the system is as full as you can get it, you fill up the overflow and you go out and drive it. And then whatever air is left in the system blows out through the expansion tank and then when it cools, it draws fluid from the expansion tank back in. After a couple of cycles, you can be pretty assured that all the air is out of the system. 
but the cooling fans don't work if there's an air pocket on top of the radiator. You, you have to have all the air out of the top of the radiator for that little uh, bimetal switch to work. So it's really important to get the, the cooling system as full as you can get it. And that means having the heater valve open. But if you've opened the heater valve now, since it's been running, and if there was any air in there, that's all blown up somehow into the front of the radiator and eventually has, has made its way out of the cooling system and into the expansion tank. So anyway, lots of questions there. But, but again, when you're filling up those 77 through 80 MGBs that have a filler on top of the thermostat, you fill them through there and get as much coolant in there as you possibly can. Squeeze the hoses, whatever you got to do. Get it absolutely full. Maybe put it in, start it up a little bit. Take it back off, check it. Um, and then fill up the coolant, the expansion tank, over full. And uh, wait for it to cycle a couple of times hot and cold and you should be okay. At the shop, we had a, a tool, a pressure tool that you could test a radiator with and pump the radiator up to whatever the pressure gauge had on the front. I don't know if it went beyond 20 pounds or so. You can blow a radiator up, put too much pressure in it. But we would use that on the expansion tank and, and force the coolant from the expansion tank into the cooling system, release it, the air would come out, pressurize it again, release it, the air would come out. We would do that before we gave it back to, to the customer. But anyway, um, Richard, your oil pressure is absolutely excellent. You're using good oil. And um, you know, you'll know you know pretty soon, um, I just don't even know um, how many mile, how many cycles you've done or if you started it up and you haven't driven it since. Are you still on, Richard? Can yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so was this yesterday and you haven't driven the, the car since or you got a hundred miles on it since then? It was, it was a few weeks ago. I've had a vacation in between, so I've not been able to get near it, but uh, I, it's, yeah, a bit of a distant memory. I feel like I did recycle it a couple of times. And I, and to your point, that, that nut on the top was a brass nut and I took that off and topped it up, tried uh, pressing on the, uh, the top hose a little bit and saw it coming out. But I just felt like, the temperature is so hot. I mean, it, at least on the gauge, on the gauge. It, it just scares me, right? So, right. So, drive down to your local place and you know your local repair shop and just say, "Hey, here's ten bucks. Would somebody come out and use an infrared pyrometer on on my on my cooling system, and just see what the temperature of the engine is at at the, the, point the really setting is, yeah. then if it's 195 and it's reading in the red well that's because the sending units faulty like all of them are if if that's a newer okay. unit yeah all right thank you really appreciate it okay all right uh the bad clutch we got a note from pat g um that said i bet that the, those bad clutches were laycock so borgen beck um has made our clutches for a long time, but Laycock, I don't know who got the name, don't know what the what the scoop was, but the pressure plates looked a lot different. The Laycock pressure plates, the clutch discs all look pretty much the same, one manufacturer to another, but the, the uh, diaphragm clutches look quite different, the Laycock ones, so. All right, um, John Tershak again, John on antifreeze is changed. Green, green is out uh, here, you, we've talked about this, and um, um, you need to change it every, every two years now. So that, that's stuff changes all the time. It used to be, what oil do I use in my differential? It was 80, 90 high point. Doesn't, you, don't, you, can't, you don't buy it like that anymore. Now it's GL, you can't even buy GL4 now at, at Napa. You gotta buy GL5, um, which everyone says, oh, don't use because it ruins the brass stuff in there. But, any oil is better than no oil, so you got to use GL5. That's what it's called now, GL5, 8090. So names change, the, the qualities of the, of the things change, the gasolines have all changed since our cars were new. So if they, if they calculated or experimented with carburetor meals, um, then, then um, in the, in the, um, the 
carburetor needles were set to use gasoline from 1962 when they were using an MB needle on the on the first MGBs, then um, um, is that still correct today with all that extra stuff in there? I've got something on my screen. I don't want to see more news. What is this thing? I've just got something which has buggered up my, my screen and I can't see my, my chat section. Something, something, oh, I don't know how to get rid of this. Uh, just a minute here, I'm gonna try, they cannot minimize, all right, so that, there, there, it's gone, thank you. No, no, it's just, oh, come on. Microsoft, I don't want Microsoft News. Okay, there, there we go, okay, I'm back. I was never gone, but um, I got excited there. So, oh, it's 10 o'clock, go figure it. How can it already be 10 o'clock? <laughs> Here we go, Ryan Massfuller's got, got, the, got the closing line here. I, we cannot do any better than this. And that is that his MG makes his MasterCard run hotter than the, radi than the radiator any day. Ask me how I know, John. <laughs> Ryan, thank you. <laughs> that's, real, that's real kind, that's real kind. I, there are 30 more new messages on here. I, I can't get to them, I apologize. It's 10 o'clock here. Now that's only what, three in the afternoon on the, on the uh, left coast. But how many people do we have here from, from uh, California? This was my experiment to see if this was handier, if we'd bring in some more people from the, from the West Coast. Um, or my I'm, here. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm here, John, from Carlsbad. Okay, okay. That's the full mill. Great. Who else, who else is from, from uh, California Way, Pacific Time? I'm here from uh, Marietta, California. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm Robert here from Sacramento, California. All right. Rob N., I'm here from Vancouver, BC, Canada. Okay. Victoria, BC. Hey, I, point made. Point made. You guys are on. Thank you very much. Gary, it's Yonavan. I see Gary Greenspoon on here. He's, he's also from... From up that way, across the other side of the border. So, um, thank you. Uh, thanks, all you guys, for, for being on. So, um, um, oh, here's a note about antifreeze. Don't leave any antifreeze on the ground. Cats are attracted, and the smallest amount of antifreeze will call, cause a horrible death. So, that's, you know, and antifreeze is sweet. I, I remember getting sicky sweet, you know. I mean, I've been leaning over the fender of an MGB for 50 years, and um, I, you know, every now and then you you end up with a with the exhaust manifold just a wash with antifreeze, and start it up, and that stuff would would evaporate, and the cooling fan on the engine would only blow some of it back, blow some of it in your face. And I remember getting physically ill. You know, didn't cause any any uh, twitches in me, but. Um, Anyway, yeah. So I, I know I know uh, I had a I had a uh, an employee who had a dog who he brought in on a weekend, and the dog licked the antifreeze, and that dog died. So point point made. But anyway, Ryan, thank you for the comment about the about the uh, Mastercard running hotter, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it to a to a close here. So I think everybody, we got 82 people on, and. Um, um, we have an official count. We didn't see if my official counter has an official count. I think I may got up to one as high. Sometimes, sometimes it's real high. We've had as many. I think we had that one time it was like two hundred and seventy. Um, and um, I noticed uh, one thirty today at one okay. point. All right. Well, that'll 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 work for today. One thirty. So, I saw 142. Oh, all right. Hey, all right. I'm, I'm I better taking, pay more attention. I'm, I'm taking bids here. I got 142. So, okay. That's great. Anyway, thank you, everyone, very, very much. Go go to my uh, website and um, uh, thank me and um, press that PayPal button. And I hate to do this, um, but I, I, I got to say it. So, um, anyway, thank you very, very much for being on. It's lots of fun. And uh, if you've got questions, you can call me. My phone number's on my website. And, and uh, if you've got questions about stuff, and I've learned stuff tonight about antifreeze and radiators. 
um, that I didn't know before. So uh, it's always a learning experience for everyone. So thanks everyone for being here and uh, thank you. unmute yourself. Thank you, John. Yep, thanks, you can... John. Great program. Thank you, John. Pleasure thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, I always learn. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And uh, Barry. Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks, John. You, John. And uh, yeah, hey, thanks Bird, again, John. Vern, August. Sunshine, they're very kind. David Massey, pleasure. 23 August next time. Uh, what did I say? 23. Yep, I'll, I'll, send a, I'll send a note out about it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, John. Okay, thank you. We will see you. Then. I'll see you around Washington, D.C. Hey, oh, yeah, maybe Altoona. Yeah, hey, Altoona. That's a that's a nice little show. I mean, they, they it's, it's usually a, have around a hundred cars. It might be it might swell up a little bit. And usually, the Triumph guys are are they're more Triumphs than MGs. And that's that's really fair. odd for a British car show, you know. So so anyone who's around Altoona anywhere, you know, look on that site and go to that show. You know, you got We got to show up in greater numbers. It's a really expensive show. I think if you sign up for the whole thing. Last time, two years ago, it was 27 bucks, uh, um, which included the dinner. So, um, I mean, I mean, you get what you pay for, but it's it's still it's a real it's a really nice day long event and uh, lots of fun. And you get a free box of Del Grosso chili, excuse me, um, spaghetti sauce and and stuff for attending. So it's worth the trip. <laughs> it is. There's, there's a good show down in Dayton. This coming weekend, Saturday, oh, about three hundred to three hundred and fifty cars. Oh my gosh! Yeah, is that so, that's an all all British show? All British show. We, there's some. We got a lot of uh, Sunbeam tri um, Tigers, and uh, even had one uh, Ford GT original. Had a Cobra there one time, yeah. original one, and uh, some really unusual cars. And of course, yeah, you might see a, a three wheeler Bond or a or a, a Reliance Scimitar yes. or yes. yeah. Both of yes. those we, they had down there. Yep. A Jowett Jupiter, a Bentley, a Rolls Royce, an Invicta, a Daimler. Yep. Oh my gosh. I love those shows because there's such a variety of stuff. Yeah. They have a usually have a car uh, from the um, transportation. transportation museum. Uh, at least one car they'll bring down. Right. So what, what's the name of this um, show? It's the. Um, oh. British car, British car Day date. Okay. All right. They, they got a website for okay. it. It's, it's, we'll see you down there, Bob. Okay. My daughter's, my daughter's coming. My wife's coming. We're bringing three cars. Oh, great. Awesome. You, We're just bringing the one. I wanted to bring two. But... For, um, not, not coming out to Atlantic City, Tony. So. Yeah. No. Well, it's going to be an interesting ride with a bad leg, but <laughs> I'll make it. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to ease down to the uh, end. And um, thanks again. Thanks, John. Pleasure. Thanks, Josh. You got questions, call. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody and more at our next, our next event. So thank you very much. See ya. Take care. Safety fast.